We're in for a real treat this afternoon. Good afternoon. On behalf of Dr. Adnan Siddiqui and Dr. Nick Hopkins, who I have the pleasure of working hand in hand with in the leadership of the Jacobs Institute, we welcome you here today. My name is Bill Maggio. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Jacobs Institute. I'm the Executive Vice Chairman of the Board of Directors of Collida Health and the Chair Emeritus of 43 North. The Jacobs Institute, or the JI as we like to call it, has consistently brought people together and led the conversation about what is possible in medicine and healthcare in the next quarter century. It began with the release of our future medicine publication in late 1917, excuse me, 2017. We are forward-looking, independent, not-for-profit. Our mission is simple, to accelerate the development of next-generation medical devices to treat vascular diseases like heart attacks and strokes through a unique collision of physicians, engineers, entrepreneurs, researchers, and industry. As such, the JI is the ideal catalyst for commissioning a visionary report and establishing an ongoing lecture series which bears the future medicine name. We invite the Western New York community to explore the next frontier in medicine with us. The JI attracts medical innovators who are spearheading new discoveries, treatments, and programs that will change the course of our lives in the next decade. Such innovators will span a variety of fields in medicine and healthcare. The chance to impact the future lies with all of us. If we collaborate and dedicate researchers, we will solve our nation's most pressing healthcare challenges. Our board chairman, Mr. Jeremy Jacobs, has demonstrated his robust support for medical innovation. Under his leadership, we commissioned the future medicine publication and this lecture series right here in the University of Buffalo's first class brand new medical school, which happens to bear his name. We value collaboration and partnership. As I have stressed through my involvement on the medical campus, collaboration amongst all organizations is paramount to our shared success. We are pleased, very pleased to host this lecture in conjunction with the University of Buffalo, its BLAST Medical Innovation Boot Camp, and of course, Dr. Steven Schweitzberg, professor and chairman of the Department of Surgery at the Jacobs School of Medicine. UB BLAST is a week-long healthcare competition for business, law, medical, and technology students. We are pleased that you can join us today to hear from Dr. David Spessler, a leading medical innovator in precision medicine. But before we do, I'd like to introduce JI's chief medical officer, Dr. Adnan Siddiqui. He is vice chairman and professor of neurosurgery and radiology at the University of Buffalo Jacobs School of Medicine. He is also the director of neurosurgery stroke services at Collida Health and director of the Cannon Stroke and Vascular Research Center. He has over 400 peer review publications and more than 75 medical book chapters and has been invited to speak at more than 300 national and international conferences. But most importantly, I'm proud to say he is my partner in leading the JI. Dr. Siddiqui. Turn it on. Uh, he's a doctor. I'm sorry. Thank you, Bill. This is a it's a great honor to um, to be um, part of this wonderful process uh, that was started by the vision of the chairman of the Jacobs Institute, Jeremy Jacobs, uh, by commissioning the work called the Future of Medicine, which I hope all of you will get a chance to enjoy. It's in front of you. It's something uh, that you should all sort of peruse through in your time, and I'm just delighted that uh, we have uh, as our speaker today, David Spessler, who uh, is pursuing work that is on page eight within the next five years column of precision medicine for treating cancer, and it's just wonderful to have you here um, as we proceed in the future uh, of a variety of different aspects of healthcare that were part of this work uh, that was commissioned. We talk about uh, genomics, we're gonna be listening about genomics, we talk about intervention, we talk about AI, uh, all these aspects that were predicted, are predicted in this work, are uh, omnipresent in the work that's being done by Dr. Spetzler, and it's just an absolute joy for us to welcome him here. 
Uh, I'm also just delighted uh, to welcome this very large gathering that we have here, which shows the enthusiasm we have in our local community to participate as we lead our future towards medicine. Hi, Jerry. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Hopkins, or Bill, you want to come back and introduce? Okay. So um, it's my absolute pleasure uh, and honor to invite the, the man who made me, not biologically, um, but uh, my mentor, my friend, um, Nick Hopkins, whose vision we all live. Thanks, Adnan. So I get to introduce David Spetzler. Um, he got his master's in mathematics and statistics to start out with. Um, went on and got his PhD in molecular biology. Uh, then decided that wasn't enough. He went out and got an MBA. And um, what you're going to hear today is you're going to hear something that I'm really excited about. You're going to hear about precision medicine made easy to understand. And David, if you can do that. <laughs> um, this week earlier, he was featured in New York City at the Uber Elite Awards as the featured awardee of the most innovative people in America. Um, tomorrow, if you pick up Newsweek, you'll find a whole piece on David and his team at Keras Life Sciences. Um, he's just done an amazing thing learning how to analyze tumors at a level that's never been done before in a level of complexity and an order of magnitude greater than anyone else has ever done. Um, I don't want to talk too much about all the specifics. I want to tell you a little bit of a personal story about David. Um, David and Gerson, he's left my wife. Jack. Hey, Jack. Um, their, their firstborn, um, Olivia, had a serious genetic problem that left her mentally disabled. Um, and in spite of that, they have raised her, they nurtured her, um, and but that single event changed David's path from neuroscience into how to fix genetic problems, which led him into cancer. When he met another guy who has an amazing personal story, um, a multi-billionaire, founded a company by the name of Keras Life Sciences. Why did he do that? Because his mom got cancer and eventually died from her cancer. Um, and he decided he's going to take all of his billions and he's going to solve the problem of cancer. And then by some great fortuitous event, he and David Spessler came together. And they have built this amazing precision medicine analysis group uh, in Phoenix. So, um, so it's, it's so interesting and appropriate that two people with personal stories that drove them to success and came together to solve the problem of cancer. It's not solved yet, but if anybody's ever going to get there, it's going to be David and his team at Keras. So um, without any further ado, I just want everybody to welcome David Spessler. Complexity of the system, uh, I'll walk you through a little bit, but 
Uh, needless to say, it makes things like the space shuttle look like a very simple paper airplane. Uh, and so what we have to do is utilize as much information as we can and really expose the power of computing systems available today to identify underlying patterns in these modular systems that allow us to intervene and help patients. And so when we start to think about this, uh, we describe it in terms of a multi-state attractor system. Um, and so what that means from a mathematical perspective is that we use partial differential equations to describe all these complexities. And we then move this through time. And so as we're beginning to think about these molecular systems, we're talking about tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of unique variables that all come together to modulate our system. And, and that's what we want to try and figure out. And so what we're talking about then in practice is moving the care of cancer patients away from population-based medicine towards individual patient medicine so that we're tailoring the specific treatment strategy to the nature of that person's disease. And the more we know about the tumor, the more we can accomplish this. And it requires not just that information, but it also requires having appropriate therapeutic interventions available. But in order to make those interventions, we need to have an understanding of what's going on. So there's a whole circle that happens here where we find genetic abnormalities, molecular abnormalities, and then we can start to develop cures for that particular type of disease. And that word, cure, is not used lightly in the field of cancer. It very, very rarely happens. Uh, and in fact, until about five years ago, nobody would dare utter that word. And it wasn't until immunotherapy came on the scene that we've actually started to accomplish that in a relatively small percentage of cancer patients, but it is happening. Uh, and that's what precision medicine can do. And so it's often described as, you know, you're looking for that needle in the haystack, but what we need to do is turn that haystack into a haystack of needles. And so every single patient's disease is different, and we can attack that in an intelligent way by understanding these systems. And so at Keras, uh, the way that we're approaching this is through doing a lot of testing. Uh, and so we test DNA, a 592 gene panel. We test RNA, the entire transcriptome. So 22,000 genes are expressed uh, with about 62,000 isoforms. And so that's where we start to get a lot of variables happening here. Uh, and then we look at the protein as well. And so, you know, when you think about DNA, RNA, and protein, the way that, that I always try and just describe it is think about your house. So the DNA is your architectural blueprint. And so my house is, is pretty old. It was built in the 70s. And so if you look at how the house is today, it does not match very well the underlying genetic blueprints, uh, the underlying architectural blueprints. So sometimes cancer, though, it, it happens there. You know, somebody puts a bearing load in the wrong spot or, you know, there's a, a bad plumbing uh, line. Uh, but oftentimes it's things that have changed along the way. And so the RNA is kind of the, the carpenter's blueprints that have modulated uh, and changed your, your house uh, as it's been remodeled. And then finally, the protein, that's your actual house. And so often in cancer, you know, we're looking for Where's that faucet turned on that's spreading water through the entire house? Or you know, where's, where's the electrical fire? And so as much as we can, we want to get to that protein component. Uh, but it's hard because there are orders of magnitude increases in complexity. You go from that 22,000 genes to the 62,000 isoforms to more than uh, a couple million unique protein isoforms. They all then work together in complex ways. Uh, and so we've got to start to address that through big data. And so we've been doing this type of testing for the last decade. Uh, we've tested over 175,000 patients to date. Uh, we still have uh, tumor tissue available to continue to understand it on about 90,000 of those patients. Uh, but then most importantly is we have longitudinal outcome data on 158,000 of those patients. And so what we need to do is understand what action was taken that benefited those patients and could we have predicted that response with the underlying molecular data that we have. And as you find these patterns, then all of a sudden we create new opportunities to improve patient care. And that's what it's going to be all about, is how do we improve patient care? How do we enable greater access to this technology to be able to improve patients' lives? And so uh, we have a whole uh, service organization uh, that we have put together. So we are extremely patient-centric. Uh, and to be patient-centric uh, for a diagnostic company really means that you take good care of the doctors. Uh, that you facilitate the doctor's available, uh, availability to understand the report uh, and get the report with as little time and effort as possible. And so uh, it's a white glove service is how we describe it. 
Uh, and at the end of the day, we try and reduce it to red is bad and green is good. So uh, as much as is possible, uh, taking the complexity of this data and turning it into very simple, actionable results. Uh, and we do that uh, every single day. So uh, this is actually a service that is covered by most insurance. We've been at it long enough uh, that it is part of routine uh, clinical care for late stage cancer patients. Uh, and it's something that uh, we take a great deal of pride in. And one of the things that we do differently uh, is we take a lot of care in the treatment of the specimen. So uh, when you have a patient's tumor specimen, uh, it is the most precious thing in the world to that patient because it had to be removed from their body, uh, which is a very unpleasant thing, as you can probably imagine. Uh, and when that happens, there are tumor cells uh, within that piece of tissue, but there are also a lot of normal cells within the tissue. And so if you just blindly take that sample and test it, uh, you're gonna have a significant dilution effect where the normal cells are actually uh, telling you something that's not there, that's not about the cancer. And so we perform what's called microdissection uh, on all of the samples that we are testing in order to enrich for what has actually gone wrong in this patient. Uh, and it takes a fleet of pathology assistants uh, Anyone that ever comes to Phoenix, you're welcome to have a tour of the lab and I'll show you the great team that is doing this work. Uh, but it's immensely uh, painful to have to tell somebody that you cannot deliver a result. And this step allows us to maximize that delivery of results. And so here's an example. So uh, the tissue here uh, is a large piece of tissue and our pathologist has circled in green where the cancer cells reside. And so we go in there and we scrape that uh, with a knife and just extract those cells. And the reason why that's important is because that tumor in this particular situation is covering 30% or so of the total tissue that's there. But within that, it's only 50-50. So the total tumor density is only 15% in this sample. That makes it untestable by most labs. Uh, it has to be greater than 20%. But by going in and doing the microdissection, it's 50%. So this is an example of a case where we would be successful in delivering results where any other approach would not. Uh, and that's critical. So the success rate is how we judge how well we're doing. And we want that to be as close to 100% as possible. Um, and where we're uh, focused now and where we're achieving uh, success is in about 94% of cancer patients. And so if you look in the literature uh, at clinical trials, how often people can be successful uh, in routine care, uh, it's only about 70% um, or 60%, sorry. And so that additional 30% really matters a lot if you're one of those patients. And so we take our job very, very seriously in terms of doing everything we possibly can to deliver these results to patients. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is really at the end of the day understand how can we take advantage of this great new revolution in cancer treatment. And that's using immunotherapy. So immunotherapy is a new type of drug and it's uh, doing something that is very different. So instead of trying to attack the cancer directly, instead we're stimulating the immune system to go in and attack the cancer. And that's a much smarter way of going about fighting cancer. Uh, but it means that we have to understand the immune system. And the immune system is probably the single most complex system uh, that we've ever encountered as a species. Uh, it is unbelievable the complexity that exists within our immune system. But we can reduce it to kind of three basic uh, you know, legs of the stool. And so there's PDL1, uh, which is a checkpoint protein that allows us to initiate an immune system. Uh, then we need to have the infiltrating leukocytes, the actual soldiers that are going to go in there and kill the cancer. Uh, and then finally, we need the things on the cancer that can be the not self, that can be recognized as the immune system uh, or by the immune system in order to kill the cancer cell. And so those three things together, if we can understand them, allow us to begin to use a patient's immune system to fight the cancer. And that's really what we're trying to do. And so here's an example of uh, an assay that we're building right now. Uh, and it's a three colored immunohistochemistry. And so, uh, what we're able to do is actually look at what's happening within a patient's tumor. And so the yellow is telling us where the tumor is. The lighter blue and the pink are telling us about different populations of immune cells that reside there. And so there's this phenomenon called T cell exhaustion, where your immune system is suppressed, and so you're not going to respond well. And we need to kind of prime the immune system before giving these drugs. Uh, in order to elicit the optimal response. And so understanding the state of that tumor uh, and the immune system's 
uh, abundance near the tumor is critical for making these decisions. Uh, and so this is one example of how we can begin to, to do that. And so uh, we get visual information. We get to see the tumor morphology, how it's arranged. Uh, and we can use AI-based image analysis to include this data in the comprehensive suite of information that we're generating at the molecular level. Uh, to understand the not-self part, uh, one of the more uh, attractive biomarkers that is on the scenes now is called total mutations burden. And so basically, it's not any one mutation that may necessarily matter, but how many in total have occurred. And so by measuring all of them at once, then we can really begin to see uh, how that is impacting patient care. Uh, and it's a biomarker that has gone through some ups and downs. We thought it was going to be a great predictor in lung cancer, which turned out to not necessarily be quite true. Um, but more recently, uh, we saw some work coming out of Memorial Sloan Kettering that actually showed that the percentile for tumor mutational burden uh, is very predictive for patients' response to immunotherapy across all solid tumor types. And so that's very exciting because the more we can define cancer not by the organ, but rather by that molecular pathway, the better we can treat patients. And we've got great examples now of drugs that have been approved that way. Uh, MSI, for example, uh, is an underlying genetic abnormality that makes patients eligible for Keytruda or pembrolizumab uh, with exceptional responses, uh, independent of the tumor of origin. Uh, and in fact, here is some uh, MSI data. So um, I'm a numbers guy, I'm a mathematician, I have to apologize for that all the time. I tend to geek out a little bit on the numbers, um, but uh, you know, I think this is a good demonstration of the type of level we go to in terms of trying to validate our work. Uh, so this assay, uh, we validated on more than 2,000 patients. Uh, and so uh, typically the CLIA standards uh, would require maybe 20 to 30. Uh, and we really consider that to be completely unacceptable. Um, it's really too low of a bar. And so we set the bar much, much higher. Uh, and this is a good example of this. Uh, and so this is the actual data from the study here, that waterfall plot. Um, and the FDA approved this drug for all cancer patients based upon these results. Uh, and the reason is, is that the patients that were enrolled on this trial should have been dead within nine months. Uh, the trial was stopped after three years. 80% of the patients were still alive. And that bottom part of the curve right there, there is no more detectable disease. So that was the population and the study that all of a sudden we started flirting with the cure word. Uh, because as far as we can tell, and these patients are still being tracked, uh, that their disease is gone. And that is truly remarkable for a metastatic cancer patient. Uh, we work with the NCI. So we're very collaborative in how we approach things. Uh, we believe that this problem is way too big for any one group to solve. Uh, so uh, we make all of our data available to our partners. Uh, and that's a really important thing when it comes to genomics, because there's so much that we can learn uh, by taking this data and exploring it. Uh, and so here's how we validated our, our copy number alterations uh, with the NCI. Um, the whole transcriptome assay that we're running on RNA has been submitted to the FDA, and they gave us breakthrough status on that. Uh, so this is probably one of our more exciting uh, products. We launched that in February, um, and it's been a remarkable, remarkable assay because it's finding what are called fusion events. Uh, and fusions, uh, are where one gene will start, and then it'll turn into another gene. Uh, and that makes a chimeric protein. And so you can think about it uh, like you know, you've got a Ford on one half of your car, and you've got a Chevy on the other. Uh, so the systems don't talk to each other very well, and uh, you're not going to make it very far if you try and drive down the freeway. Uh, and so that's what's happening at the molecular level, too, with these fusion events. And they're very easy to attack because they're weak. They're not part of your normal system. Uh, and so it's great to be able to attack humans. And so that was the second hand tumor drug that the FDA approved uh, was for a fusion event called Pentrap. Uh, and again, the patients are having exceptional responses. Um, so one of the things that uh, becomes clear is that delivery of these new and exciting drugs is a substantial challenge. Uh, right now, you pretty much have to go to the large academic centers to get access to these trials and these drugs. Uh, but that's not an efficient way of actually practicing medicine. Eighty percent of patients are seen in the community setting. And so we need a way to distribute these exciting new drugs. Uh, and so we bought a company uh, called Pharmatech that does just that. It's a just-in-time clinical trial network. It's got more than 200 sites uh, already enrolled. And what we're trying to do is change the paradigm for how clinical trials are performed. So right now what happens is 
you've got your physician that's going to order these molecular tests, and they're going to get you know, thousands and thousands of biomarkers worth of data. And then they have to know, oh, hey, this one there's a trial for, and the trial is over here. And that is just not a reasonable expectation for us to put on our oncologists. Uh, and so we're trying to change that model and say, hey, we know all of the molecular findings, and we know where the trials are. So rather than try to rely on the busy clinician uh, to connect those dots, we want to connect the dots for them and bring the trial to the patient so the patients don't have to travel to go get the treatment they deserve. Rather, we bring the trial to them, uh, and it's remarkable. So with this network, we're actually able to start a trial within as little as 10 days, uh, which is just insane. It usually takes about six months uh, to get a trial. Um, so the question is, does this actually help patients? Uh, and hopefully, I've already given you enough hints that it does. But here are just a snapshots of some of the data that has been done over the last uh, five to 10 years, uh, showing over and over and over again that molecularly guided treatment improves patient care. So uh, this isn't the future of medicine. This is the present of, me uh, of medicine. Uh, this is all happening today. It's available today. It's how patients are being treated today, uh, and it's exciting. Uh, but this is the future of medicine uh, talk, and so um, I do want to spend a little bit of time on the future. Uh, and so the future, as uh, we at Keras see it, uh, involves using what we're calling next generation profiling. Uh, and what this is is the application of AI technology to these exceptionally large data sets. Uh, and I, being a mathematician, um, often get asked about AI, and I just love to show this slide. So these are the most common algorithms that are applied in machine learning and artificial intelligence systems today, and it lists who invented them and the year that they were invented. Uh, and so if you look at that list, you know, this is not new math. A lot of this math has been around for a really long time. Uh, but what it is uh, is the application of all the computing power to large data and to these uh, systems that we have. And so by being able to run these algorithms you know, tens of millions of times per day, we can find things that we couldn't find previously. So whenever anyone's talking to you about AI, you can always be like, oh yeah, uh, what about that K nearest neighbors algorithm? Uh, that one's pretty old, right? Year 1000? Uh, that was a little while ago. And the other thing that we have to be very careful with uh, is that causation and correlation are two completely different things. Uh, so this is another one of my, my fun figures here. Uh, and it's looking at the number of winning letters in the Scripps National Spelling Bee compared to the number of deaths uh, due to venomous spiders. And the data is incredibly highly correlated. Uh, but obviously, there is no causality here whatsoever. So we have to be careful not to delude ourselves that we think we know something that we actually don't. Uh, and so the way that we address that is, called, uh, is through something called permutation testing. And so uh, with the advent of machine learning, uh, this is really the only statistical tool that we have available to us to protect ourselves against false discovery. Uh, and so what you do is you've got your two populations. You've got you know, patients that respond to a drug and patients that don't respond to a drug. And you spend uh, a lot of computing power to identify an underlying algorithm. Uh, and then what you have to do is you randomly reassign the patients to two different groups and redo all of the machine learning. And if you can find a signal that separates the randomly assigned groups just as well as the true groups, uh, then you know that you're looking at a spelling bee result uh, and that this is not uh, something real. And so it becomes incumbent upon us to understand how do we validate these new algorithms that we're able to build. Uh, and that's uh, not going to be a simple task. Um, and so the way that we approach this is we take all the DNA data that we have, we take all the RNA data that we have, we take all the protein data that we have, and we put it all together uh, with the clinical outcomes, and we look for these patterns. Uh, and so one of the first problems that we uh, tried to tackle was diagnosing cancer. So uh, there is a substantial percentage of late-stage cancer patients that don't know what kind of cancer they have. Uh, so it's called cancer of unknown primary. Uh, but there can also be ambiguously defined cancer, where you know maybe it's bile duct, maybe it's colon, uh, but they're not really sure. And so it's very difficult to treat a patient if you don't know exactly what kind of disease uh, they have. And so uh, we look at what is the hallmarks, what are the genetic features that define disease, uh, and say, can we use that information to diagnose these cancers of unknown primary? Uh, and the answer is yes. And so we just presented 
uh, our validation study of more than 15,000 patients. Uh, that's in the validation set, uh, not the training set. There were more than 30,000 patients in the training sets. Uh, and these were the numbers that we achieved. Uh, and these numbers are uh, actually uh, incredibly, incredibly high for solving this problem uh, because there's a fundamental challenge where you don't know what the truth is. So how do you, how do you prove that you have the truth if nobody knows what the truth is? Uh, and so it becomes very challenging uh, to actually validate these types of algorithms. Uh, but we had a, a fleet of pathologists uh, go through and uh, were able to, to accomplish that. Here's another example. Uh, this one a little more uh, relevant. So in frontline colorectal cancer, uh, patients are either going to get full FOX or they're going to get full FURY. Uh, and the side effects of both of those are unpleasant. Uh, and nobody knows which one to go with first. So a sequencing question. You're going to get both uh, in all likelihood, but which one do you do first? Uh, and so we used our data to find an algorithm that would predict uh, this patient should get full FOX, this patient should get full FURY. Uh, and this first Kaplan-Meier curve here, uh, that was from our validation study, and then we had a second blinded study, uh, and we're achieving hazard ratios of, of 0.3, and so that's, that's really good. Um, that means that we can really effectively identify patients that are going to benefit from full FOX relative to full FURY, uh, and that matters a lot, uh, because those, these drug combinations work in very different ways. Uh, and the side effects of platinum in particular are quite unpleasant. And so if you can avoid taking an unnecessary treatment, uh, you can really improve things a lot. Uh, and so we have uh, a phase three uh, randomized trial population uh, that uh, we're now using to fully validate this. This is uh, now in the future. Uh, let me be clear that this is not prime time, but uh, we are living in the future now. And so the next step uh, into the future uh, is around a technology that we call ADAPT. Uh, it stands for Adaptive Dynamic Artificial Polyligand Targeting. Um, the doors are now locked, and to exit the room, you're gonna have to repeat that. So I hope you wrote it down. Um, and so what this is is an attempt to try to begin to understand how do we address uh, complex systems. And so, um, again, when we look at uh, how molecular biology works, we've got 22,000 genes. Uh, and in the true biological setting, they're going to get turned into more than 200,000 unique protein isoforms, right? Our assay is only measuring about 62,000 of them right now, uh, but there are a lot more, and we haven't even figured out what they look like. And then those get turned into unique proteins, more than 2 million of them. Uh, but these things work together in complex machines. And so uh, if we look at only the parts, then it's really difficult to understand the system. And so you know, if you think about a Ford dealership and a Napa auto parts store, right? you're going to find carburetors, you're going to find transistors, steering wheels. But that doesn't tell you, do you have a fully formed car, or do you have a junkyard or a parts store? Uh, and so that's what we need to understand to figure out what's going on. Because in the case of cancer, it's more of the fact, is the car on? Is it driving towards a cliff? Uh, and so knowing that somebody has a steering wheel becomes less relevant in that context. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do. And so this is, this is one of my favorite slides here. So this is showing why DNA is not going to give us all the answers that we hope for. So these two animals are genetically identical. It is the same animal. So in captivity, pigs are in this permanently juvenile state. When they escape, they go feral. It can happen as, in as little as three months. There is an increase in testosterone due to stress and changes in diet that causes them to grow their tusks and get all hairy. And so as we're thinking about these molecular systems, you know, looking at that blueprint of the house is just not enough. We've got to look uh, more broadly. We've got to figure out you know, where is the water turned on in the bathroom uh, that is overflowing, or you know, where is that electrical fire? And so the protein situation is really where uh, that's happening. And if we can understand that, then we can really do things better. And so we're using uh, things called aptamers uh, to, to try to gain insight into this problem. Um, and so this is where I'm going to really geek out on the math, sorry. Um, but aptamers are short synthetic pieces of DNA. So they don't match anything that's in the human body or any other animal. Uh, they're completely artificial. But we can use the power of DNA as a way to begin to understand the complexity of this. And so um, if we think about a 100 base strand of DNA, uh, that's, you know, pretty short uh, as far as DNA goes. The human genome is 3 billion bases long. Um, and if we wanted to make those uh, all possible 100 mers, that's 4 to the 100th power or 10 to the 60th power. Uh, and so if we wanted to synthesize each and every one of those, uh, it's going to weigh a lot. Uh, it corresponds to about 10 to the 38th kilograms of DNA. So does that seem like a, a large number, 10 to the 38th? 
So let's put it in context. So Earth itself only weighs 10 to the 25th kilograms, right? So making one copy of each of the possible 100 mers is gonna produce a mass that is substantially larger than the weight of the Earth. In fact, that mass is equivalent to almost our entire galaxy. Not quite, cut off the arms there, it's a little bit smaller than our galaxy, uh, and gave absolutely no merit to dark matter, because uh, nobody knows how much there is of that in our galaxy. But that's the scale that we're talking about, right? So now all of a sudden, you can imagine the informatics power of using these to decipher this system that is so complex. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do. And so these things fold up and they bind to proteins. And so that folding and binding gives us a handle on what is there and how to measure it. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to do. Um, and in practice, what we basically do um, is we take a library of these oligos, and it's not all of them, obviously, uh, but it's about 10 to the 13th, which is still a lot. That's 1,000 trillion molecules. Um, and we can stain the cancer in patients that respond to a drug uh, and not stain the cancer in a patient that doesn't respond. And in that way, without understanding what's happening, uh, we can identify features that differentiate patients that respond to therapy from patients that don't respond to therapy or identify patients with cancer uh, from those that don't have cancer. Uh, and so we go through all the standard validation methodologies to show that this works, and, and it does. And we've been publishing on this for, for years now. Um, and uh, here's one of the, the better ones. We got this one published in Nature Communications. Uh, but it shows that uh, this approach works to decipher these incredibly complex systems. Uh, and that's what we need. We're gonna have to have new technologies to address the sheer complexity of that underlying biological system. We can apply it to blood, too. Uh, we target these things called exosomes, which are uh, really, really small, lipid encapsulated bodies, almost like miniature cells that are floating around in the blood. Um, and there are a lot of them. They're about 10 to the 10th in one mil of plasma. Uh, mil is, is a little bit smaller than a teaspoon. Um, and so we can uh, do that same approach. And in this case, uh, we built a test that is looking for uh, men with prostate cancer. Uh, and so we achieved an AUC of about 0.9 uh, with this particular test in our uh, cohort of 231 patients. Uh, and, and again, this is a way of trying to understand how do you identify what's gone wrong early enough to have an appropriate intervention. Because if we have to wait for stage four, then we're failing. We really want to find it early on, stage one, stage two, where we can cut it out and just be done with it. Uh, that's the ideal still. Uh, and these types of technologies uh, are going to make that more possible. Um, and so um, the last place that this works is in drug development. And so uh, drug development is uh, going through a revolution right now. And uh, I was actually very pleased to see a very comparable revolution happening here at the Jacobs Institute, where we're moving away from animal models and moving more into models that directly simulate what's happening within a human being. Uh, and so with all this molecular information that we're gathering on patients, it gives us a lot of information to design better drugs. And so instead of using mouse models or cell lines, we can actually use information from real patients to find new drug targets. Uh, and that's what we've been doing. Uh, and have some that are in par, uh, pharma's pipeline to, to try and develop new drugs. And so uh, not only can we start to understand the system, uh, but it also then uh, delivers us the mechanism by which we can start to manipulate that system. And we really need to be able to manipulate it uh, to, to treat patients appropriately. And so what we're looking for, again, is what are these things that are present in the cancer uh, that are absent uh, in the normal adjacent tissue and isn't normally going to be there? because. Uh, the side effects from these drugs happen when the drug is binding to something other than the cancer, and we really want to avoid that as much as possible. Uh, so if you can be really specific, uh, then you can have very powerful drugs that are going to minimize those deleterious side effects. Um, and so what I hope to have imparted uh, in, this, in this lecture is that um, there is a massive technological revolution that is happening right now, uh, and it's happening at a scale that is... Uh, really outstanding uh, in terms of the underlying benefit to human longevity and to fighting complex diseases. Uh, but we're at the very beginning of this journey. Uh, we have a lot more work to do, uh, and it's going to require massive collaboration uh, around the world because it's going to take millions of patients' worth of data to really be able to solve these problems. Uh, and I'm just happy to have one small part to play, uh, and I'm 
just want to thank uh, all of the organizers here uh, for being so gracious and for uh, allowing me to, to opine on my favorite topic. Um, and I uh, just want to say thank you all for, for showing up. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Okay. All right, I think we have some time for some questions, right? Do we have time for questions? Great. Who wants to kick it up? Okay, there you go. Okay, so um, I'm currently a researcher at Roswell Park, and I noticed that um, in my research, there's a lot of people who are interested in the Roswell Park, and they're 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 interested in the Roswell Especially since one thing we found that has caused a lot of issues in terms of getting uh, uh, tissue, that we need fresh tissue for getting uh, these cells. So that has been also creating more your own too. So I was just wondering if you could comment on if you have any plans for the future. Sure. Um, we don't, um, at least at this stage. The reason being, um, is that until we show that single cell sequencing actually uh, derives strategies for treatment that are uh, superior than measuring everything, then uh, it's a research platform, not a clinical platform. And we uh, focus primarily on clinical platforms when it comes to sequencing. Um, if that day comes, then happily do it. I'm assuming you're using the 10X system. Um, certainly played with that, and it's a, it's a nice system, but uh, for clinical sequencing, what we're looking for really is the dominant clone uh, and population anyway. That's the first one you want to kill. Um, and then we can see all the underlying secondary clonal events. Uh, and uh, you know, sometimes that is going to indicate uh, second or third line treatment. Uh, but a lot of times, uh, that first treatment is going to change things. I mean, we see on average about six new mutations uh, introduced uh, with one round of therapy. Um, and so probably going back and looking again uh, is more appropriate, which is probably where liquid biopsy has its uh, best place. Uh, Dr. Metzler, what's, uh, what's the biggest obstacle to your mission in the next couple of years? Um, I think it's education. Uh, only about 15% of eligible cancer patients are receiving this level of testing. Um, and that's, that's unfortunate. It should be 100%. Um, and it's not just the, the broad-based testing that we do. Uh, if you look at the testing rates for EGFR and non-small cell lung cancer that has been around for more than a decade, uh, it's still atrociously low. It's in the 80% uh, range. And so um, we need to make uh, this testing standard. Uh, whether it's us or somebody else, uh, it's just in the best interest of patients to learn as much as, as possible. In the back. So, when you take a piece of tu a tissue from a cancer patient, you're really getting a core biopsy, and that's a snapshot of what is happening in that particular location of the tumor uh, that you've got. So, and that, that doesn't really speak to the heterogeneity that may be there in the, the rest of the tumor. Um, what are your thoughts on that, and what are your thoughts on um, investigating circulating tumor DNA, not circulating tumor cells, but circulating tumor DNA? Yeah, so um, if it's a core needle biopsy, which it often is, then we are absolutely limited by that inherent heterogeneity, uh, especially if we're talking about metastatic disease where there can be multiple lesions that can all look very, very different. Uh, so that's a place where cell-free DNA has the potential to be very uh, informative. I think one of the challenges that we face there uh, is that it's only about 75% of stage four cancers or uh, cancer patients are actually shedding sufficient material into circulation to be able to test. So um, for that 75% where we can find it, uh, great, we should look at it, and uh, we are doing that. Um, but for the other 25%, then we're just going to be limited by whatever we can get in the tissue. Um, and I don't know a way around that uh, at this stage, but it's certainly a limitation. Please. Yeah, you. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
I have a math question since you're a math guy. Um, in your research, have you had more success using neural net type algorithms or like gradient boosted decision tree algorithms? It depends on the nature of the data. So if you're dealing with uh, continuous variables, uh, then boosted trees do exceptionally well. Uh, if you're doing uh, work with more discrete data uh, systems, then neural networks do better. Um, the way that we actually do it is uh, we do both. Uh, we actually, in our machine learning application, have implemented about 550 different algorithms, and then we let them vote and fight against each other. Um, so IBM has Watson, we have Dean, um, and it stands for Deliberation Analytics uh, because it's all about uh, letting the algorithms fight against each other and see who wins. As a follow-up, do you guys use mostly like Python to develop those algorithms? We try and have at least three different code bases on everything that we do so that we're not uh, stuck with any one particular impl implementation um, having an artifact in there. And so if we can't replicate the results on multiple code bases, then um, it's not real. Um, almost all of the patients that we see are from the U.S. Um, about 5% are international, uh, but um, this type of testing is not uh, covered by insurance outside of the United States, uh, so it becomes a very select population uh, that can afford it, because uh, it, it can be expensive. Um, so the numbers we have internationally are too small to say anything. Uh, There are definitely proprietary concerns, uh, and all of our competitors uh, hoard their data. We just fundamentally, philosophically think that that's not appropriate. Uh, as uh, Nick said, the, the way that uh, our company came into existence was really by trying to make a difference in patients' lives. Uh, and the best way to accomplish that is by sharing what we know. Uh, and so. Yeah, we make all the raw FASTQ files and BAM files available because um, we don't suffer from the not invented here syndrome. Uh, we just want to help people. See one over there? Where down here, I think. Hi. Where do we get these BAM and FASTQ files? If they're interested. Um, so it's uh, each institution has their own set. Um, and so for patients that would be tested here, then uh, those are all available. We've started what we call the uh, Precision Oncology Alliance, which is a network of about 30 uh, institutions, uh, academic institutions, and large community practices that have all banded together and decided to share their data between them. Um, but uh, I can't give you anybody else's data. I can only give you your data. It's definitely the intention to be a profitable venture. Uh, that's how we stay alive and be sustainable. Uh, we're paid for by insurance. We've got 185 million lives under contract. 
Uh, depending upon the particular payer and health plan, the level of coverage is gonna be different. Um, so uh, on aggregate, it keeps the lights on. Um, so right now, we, uh, we recently just uh, took on some additional capital, about 150 million to grow uh, more. Uh, but prior to that, then we had achieved uh, profitability, which for a company in our space is virtually unheard of. Uh, our biggest competitor uh, is losing about $200 million a year. Um, but they're funded by, by big pharma, so they don't mind. Bottom line question, is that uh, Iscaris a public company? No, we're private. Yes, please. Uh, other than oncology, uh, any other diseases that you would be focusing on in the future? Um, yeah, we have been looking at um, Alzheimer's and cardiovascular. Uh, as secondary fields to get into. Um, it's gonna be quite a while before we do anything too big there. Um, oncology still has a lot of work left to do. <laughs>